Okay, we've hit three o'clock, so um, let's make a start. Um, good okay. afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, just to let you know, to start with, that this webinar is being recorded so that we can share it with colleagues who are unable to um, attend the actual webinar. So um, it will be available on our, on our website soon. Um, Daniela will be presenting today. Thank you for joining us, Daniela. Um, there will be time for questions and discussions at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions while Daniela is talking, please do put them in the chat box or use the raise hand function and we will come to you at the end of the webinar. Okay, so um, I think that's everything. With that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Daniela. Okay, thanks Ruth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Daniela. I am doing the PhD in Geography in the School of Geography in Cardiff University. And today I'm going like to present uh, one of my uh, PhD chapters idea. Uh, this is something that I'm currently working. So if you have any comments or any suggestions, uh, please tell me. I will really appreciate that. Uh, so this part uh, that I'm going to present today is part of my, my PhD project. Uh, in my project, I am going to work. I, I am working with the Waju ethnic group, uh, where I am trying to identify uh, where my nutrition come from in these communities. Um, uh, so this is a, a indigenous group that is located between Colombia and Venezuela. Most of them live in the desert region. Uh, and they are divided in, in small uh, communities called rancherias that are made by five to seven families. Uh, this is an indigenous group that is a matrilineal society. Uh, their main activity, economical activities are livestock, fisheries, um, handicraft and, and commercial, um, commercial activities. Uh, and this is a group that uh, is very known here in, in Colombia and Venezuela because they have a strong liberalist uh, colonialism and Catholic missions uh, some four or five centuries ago. So uh, despite this uh, group is located between Colombia and Venezuela, I'm going to focus in, in the Wayu group located in Colombia. Uh, this because I am in, from Colombia, so it was easier for me. And also, uh, I'm going to focus, I, I decided to choose this group to make my, my PhD, because they, this is a group that are facing worse, the, maybe the worst uh, nutritional status in Colombia. They present that, and uh, despite they have a lot of, of uh, um, lot of agencies and institutions and organizations trying to solve malnutrition issues in, in La Guajira, uh, the, this problem is still persists. So I'm trying to understand why, despite all this help coming from a lot of different sources, uh, this group still uh, show the worst malnutrition status in, in, in Colombia. Um, so this is, uh, uh, they are located in La Guajira. La Guajira is a, a department uh, here in, in this part of, this is Colombia and, and this is La Guajira department. And it's divided into three, three main, main regions. Um, many of the extractivist activities are located in the, in the higher Guajira. And it's also the, the place where I, where I made my, my PhD, my, my fieldwork. So this, this region has a long history of extractivism uh, that started during the colony times where uh, they used to, Wajú people also with, together with Guajira people used to extract pearls to supply uh, colonial demands of that. Uh, then uh, during the 1920s, um, they uh, start to, to extract salt this is an activity that the Wajú well, people used to do uh, for science ever, but during the 20s, uh, it becomes an industrial activity. Um, at some years later, in, in the 70s until 80s, uh, this region faced a, a big uh, 
in an enormous traffic of cannabis from Colombia to to United United States, and at the same time, uh, the, this in this part of the country, uh, they start to extract a uh, coal uh, in, in an open sky mining that is called Sierrejón. That began in the 60s and the activities still persist. Uh, and during the beginning of this century, uh, they start to implement some uh, wine farms. So this is a, a group and a region that have faced lots of territorial change due to these extractivist projects. And all, many of them have had a, enormous consequences on, on Wajú people. Uh, in, in La Guajira in general, uh, these this extractivists create a big change in the infrastructure of, of, and in the territory. Uh, this, for example, is an, in an, an aerial photo uh, from uh, Salinas de Manaure. There is the salt, uh, the place where they produce salt, and you can see that there is a big transformation in this place. They, this used to be a uh, place where uh, fish used to come to, to make part of their reproductive cycle, and they changed that for these salt ponds. Uh, that, uh, create a big uh, change for Wajú diet, for example, because they used to depend of this fish that used to grow in these areas, but now it's, it's, it's not possible to grow fish here. here. Uh, also, it creates a, a big migration from uh, rural to urban areas um, that change the, the social structure of, of Wajú people. Uh, also create uh, a big contamination uh, from rivers and from plastic resu uh, residues and coal mining residues also. And, and they, it create a big uh, change in, in nature resources, especially in water, uh, creating big, uh, them, uh, big periods of, of droughts. And this used to be a uh, a river, the La Rancheria River, may, maybe the mainly river in, in La Guajira. And to get, thanks to, to Cerrejón Mining Company, uh, now they don't have more water. So, and for what you people, besides the effects that I previously described, uh, they, maybe the, the, the biggest effect was the territory autonomy loss. Now they, they are, uh, need, they are sharing their territory with lots of different actors. Um, they, they create also a gender role change. Uh, this because lots of, especially men went to, especially Wajú men went to work for, for these companies. Uh, so the activities that they used to do in, in their communities uh, now are, are done by kids or by women, or they are replaced by things, by, by, by food, uh, by money that they, they earn in their jobs. And it also creates uh, an alteration in the traditional food regime that what you people used to have. So in looking to try to recover the territory for this extractivist project, uh, what you people have used May, uh, like two main type of strategies. Uh, one of those is the legal or the conventional ones, and the other one are the alternatives. Um, the legal or conventional strategies uh, is uh, the these strategies that Wajú people or indigenous people in general used to try to recover their their territory and try to protect their, their culture. So. Uh, in the, they are supported by by maybe like two uh, fronts. Um, one is from an international perspective, and another is from the national uh, perspective. From the international, uh, uh, these groups uh, try to support their their claims by the ILO Convention 169. Um, this is an international um, legislation that try to protect minority groups in, in, 
in the world. Uh, there are many countries that are uh, part, that are part of this convention, and Colombia is one of those. Um, and in, at national level, uh, Colombia creates these uh, resguardos indígenas that that is like a, a places uh, created by indigenous people where they they say that they used to live here. So uh, the state need to to declare this area. Uh, for them and protect their their rights to to be there. So um, this in in La Guajira they have lots of of resguardos indígenas. That is this area here, and in these places, uh, Wajú people have collective rights over this over this territory, and in theory, uh, they are protected for for the activities of any time or any type of project trying to to change their rights over this territory. Um, so, but sometimes this type, many times, this type of, of strategies are not enough to, to protect indigenous people. So even if, if we have a, a strong constitution that say, clearly say that they are protecting minority groups, or even if, if we have, the, we are part of the ILO convention, there is not enough to, to protect indigenous people. It's, it's hard to translate these uh, rights from, from the paper to the practice. So, so many times, uh, and every time more frequently, uh, minority groups are using alternative strategies to try to recover their territory. Uh, so this because, like I said, the legal strategies uh, seems like are not enough to protect what you, uh, indigenous people from from extractive projects or main extractive projects. So they are trying to uh, appeal to challenging the nature and culture the dichotomy, and they are asking for the for the national government to declare nature as a subject of, of rights. Um, this uh, is a strategy that has been used for for many minority groups in, in lots of places. Um, in Colombia, it had been used um, in the, the first time, the first time that they used that was in 2010, when national government declared, thanks uh, to social movements, uh, they pressure to, to declare the Atrato River uh, a subject of rights. So it have a, an special protection, protection of this river. Uh, this is this is basically to try to in this case was uh, basically to try to avoid the construction of uh, hydroelectric there, um, and they are also they also do that for another river in Colombia and recently they do that for a Paramo. Uh, Paramo is an is an, uh, a unique ecosystem in high mountains, and is may, maybe is one of the the main source of water in, in Colombia. So also thanks to social movements, they, they made to, they, they uh, be able to protect this Paramo. And uh, in this case, it was because Paramo is, a, is an interesting area to, to create, um, to, to implement wine farms. So if they are trying to, and also to extract a uh, gold, for example. So they are doing that to protect creatures for natural resources. And another strategy that I would like to, to, to explore, uh, that there is one that I, that I was, that I identified during my PhD and during my fieldwork, uh, is related with social movements. But uh, first, I, uh, there are a couple of things that I, that I would like to, to say about that. Um, the social movements in Latin America, they are a little bit different of social movements in other latitudes. Uh, in Latin America, all of them are strongly related with territory, and they all of them look to to recover part of that. Uh, this is maybe the the one of the main uh, characteristics of social movements movements in in Latin America. So uh, even if uh, if it's uh, social movements from from different 
countries or they are looking for different things. Uh, territory is a central uh, topic for social movement, movements in, in Latin America. This I have, uh, I, I can show you two examples of that. Uh, one is from, this is a, 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 a phrase from Valdeliz Verón. She is a Brazilian Guarani Kiowa leader. And she said that we are going to demarcate our territory with our own blood if necessary. And the, this image in the, in the right, uh, that, that was taken, uh, taken during the um, Bogota social, in the, in the social uh, manifestations that take place in Bogota last year. Um, this was a, a, a big strike in, in, in the country. It was in, in November. And here, despite we have students, social leaders, indigenous people, uh, feminist movements, LGBTQ movements, uh, unionists, we have lots of movements uh, protesting at the same time, but territory was a, was a common issue here. Um, well, uh, this in, in, in La Guajira, we have, I, I they have a lot of, of social movements there and collect, collective groups, but uh, there are like maybe two principal. One is uh, Fuerza Mujeres Guayú, and the other one is the Junta Mayor Autónoma de Palabrios. Um, the Fuerza Mujeres Guayú is a, is a social movement uh, created by women, and they are looking to fight against violence. Uh, uh, to to Wajú people, and the second one is is created by by mainly by by men, and is is uh, uh, Palaureros is um is like a lawyer for for Wajú people, so it's a it's a group of men that try to solve problems according to a a Wajú judicial system, but that is special to to or is different to to the conventional one. So they are, they are in a group of this Junta Mayor and they, they try to solve problems uh, in that way. And they are, they, we can find also like collective uh, groups that they are not formal uh, presenting or, or they don't have a, a formal name, but it's an informal uh, congregation of, of people that are fighting for, for a common thing. Uh, so I, I try to to understand how these social movements can can work to try to recover the uh, Wajú territory that have been lost for this extractivist project, and that now is also shared by lots of different uh, actors. So uh, I, I I was able to identify that social movements in in La Guajira especially they will work like a, like a bridge between the, all the actors that share this territory. So they, these are the institutions, are, are the people, and the people that are able to create the conversations between all these different actors. And they, at the same time, they, are, they want to negotiate the control of this territory. So to in, a, in order to, to be able to perform that, to create this negotiation between actors, uh, these social movements or collective groups, they need to uh, create or, or they need to establish a common language. Uh, they need to establish like a common, a commonality between these groups and these actors. And food and nutrition issues seems to be like a common thing between all these these different groups not just the groups or, or the actors that are working with food but also other groups that are working with education or are working with or the activist companies or um, another type private companies or uh, health uh, centers all of them have as a common common language the the nutritional issues even or, or or because they have like a business, a commercial a responsibility with that, 
or uh, because hunger is an is a very sensitive uh, area in in the human it's a very sensitive dimension so it's, it's very easy to to touch people through through hunger and malnutrition discourse so i i found that that hunger is is, is the commonality of all of these um, uh, actors sharing this territory and um, when social movements start to talk with this with all of them they are trying to uh, create a uh, make them like compensate them for the for the destructive these uh, damages or they are trying to create negotiations to food or, or food related issues so many times for example they ask for seeds or they ask for for goats because they, they what you people used to consume uh, uh, goats is part of of their diet, or they ask for create um, ancestral uh, gardens to to be able to grow the food they used to eat before all all of these territorial changes, or they use things related with fisheries um, like yeah, nets or things like that. So. Uh, in this in this negotiation between these territorial actors, uh, was you woman play a central role? Uh, this is not just because they are so central for food sovereignty achievement, but also because they are able to create a, a, like a good conversation between all of, all of these actors. Um, women, especially was you women, are are known for being very active in in, in in public spaces where they can participate. Um, they are in charge of, of a delegate tasks and duties to, to other community uh, members. Uh, they are the basis of the social actors um, where food is, is the central topic and, and the way to to negotiate um, they this this when this negotiation takes place uh, is not food what they are providing uh, is not food uh, what they are doing and or making to to recover it's not food sovereignty what they are help to recover with this negotiation uh, I, I can find and I would like to propose that through these food, food related demands and, and negotiation, they are also helping to recover their territory control. So how, how that works? Um, so when, when these external institutions arrive to, to, what, to what you people to establish a negotiation, um, they need what well, you people are able to control who is going to enter in their territories or not. Um, uh, this because they are protected by these legal um, strategies and legal these rights uh, in the constitution and in the yeah, basically in the constitution. So they are able to to define who is going to enter in their territories or not, and under which type of conditions they can create these negotiations. So uh, when when they start to talk with these uh, external actors, uh, they used to propose these uh, projects or programs related with food. And many times the food that they, they propose or the or things that they would like to include in, in the in the projects uh, are made in, in the in the local in the localities. They, it's not things by in other places, but they want to create that or, or they want to grow that in, in their lands. So they communities began to require a workforce to supply these institutions' demands. This create a uh, migration. Uh, now from urban to rural uh, areas, and this uh, create like a with this is is uh, it, this is something that uh, be, uh, create the possibility to start to to reveal the social fabric that used to that was broken uh, for these previous uh, mentioned activities. 
Um, so then uh, these external actors and institutions uh, need to create spaces where they can uh, talk and they can uh, create a negotiation between what you people and them. So this create spaces where, where people can participate. And this exchange of knowledge and exchange of opinions uh, create a solid relationship where women again play a central role because many times there are the, the ones that are talking in this, in this uh, public uh, participation spaces. Uh, with, with this uh, participation, uh, these communities become stronger and they become they start to have knowledge of their rights and they start to uh, again start to identify identify between them and start to create relationships within within with within them and they are also like around food and and around uh, institutions demands but this is also creating a, a, a social dynamic or recovering this uh, social dynamic. Um, so in order to watch your people supply these new food demands uh, by external actors, uh, these actors need, need to surrender some territorial control to control to watch your people. So in this way, maybe it's, it's not a conscious thing or maybe it's, it's not a the first aim of, of these negotiations but with that what you people are able to in, in the middle of these negotiations around around food well what you pe what you people is able to recover some of their territorial control so uh, with this when what you people use food sovereignty elements to food food related issues they also began to recover the, the control over their territories. So in my, I, in my research, I, I would like to suggest that, that food sovereignty will not just be reached before territory, like the literature used to say, like you need to have territory and then you can have food sovereignty. I, I would like to propose that sometimes you can have food sovereignty even before territory, but that it also can be a vehicle to achieve territory recovery in women play a central role in this, in this negotiation. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Daniela. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Daniela? No? You obviously gave a very comprehensive presentation, Daniela. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Um, if no one has any questions, oh, there's a question. Oh, just a thank you. Thank you for joining us, Doc. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. The, um, if you'd like to watch the webinar again, it'll be up on our website soon. So, um, Thank you very much, everyone, and hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks.